This morning, if you would, go ahead and take out your Bibles. Turn to 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22. While you're finding your way there, just a couple kind of uh, uh, commercials, if you will, tonight uh, for our evening service, which begins at five o'clock. We're going to be starting a new series entitled Psalms of Praise. Psalms of Praise. You know, like I talked about with it as well, you know, a lot of times we think that the only time that, uh, you know, we, ha- we should praise is, you know, if everything's going well and everything's great. But really, you know, when we read through the Psalms, we find that there's a lot of times when things were not going well. And the psalmist doesn't shy away from that. You know, the psalms were written by a number of guys. Uh, David wrote many of those. And there are times when David is like, hey, I was in the deepest, darkest valley and everything was bad and I, and I couldn't see any hope. But then I looked to the Lord. And then he starts praising God. So he went from, I'm in the, the deepest pit of despair to, I, I turn my eyes to the Lord and, and man, I just, I praise the Lord for who he is and for how great he is and for how he's taking care of me. And, and, and it's good for us to change our focus sometimes because we're really good. Let me, let me make this personal. I'm really good at focusing on the negative sometimes. Now I made it personal, but let's just be real. We all are. I, like, you know, now there's, there's the rare person that's always positive, you know, and they're pretty annoying. I get it. But, uh, you know, for the most of us, like we can find the negative in about any situation. And a lot of times we get so wrapped up in the negative and we're so focused on, on, on that, we forget about all the things that God has done and continues to do for us. And so I want to encourage us through this series, Psalms of Praise. There are 150 psalms. We're not going to look at every single psalm. And in there, there's a bunch of praise psalms. We're not going to be able to see all of them, but we're going to look at some of them with that idea of let, let's pull out some of these selections and talk about how we can look through the book of Psalms and, and, and be directed to praise the Lord and then take that away from here where each of us individually can dig in deeper into those. So that'll be starting tonight. We'll have a series on Sunday nights called Psalms of Praise. And then Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we're going to begin a series through the book of Jonah called God's Relentless Love. And here's the thing, Jonah, I mean, I've preached through Jonah before in one sermon. Like I could tell you the entire story. I, we've got kids in here that could tell you the entire story of Jonah in one message because it's, it's a short book. It's four chapters. I think I counted up 47 or 48 verses. So it's, it's short. We could do that in one sermon, but there's so much there that if we step back and we take our time, we can spend a little, a little bit of time in there. So we'll probably be four, or five, six weeks in the book of Jonah starting next Sunday. So I encourage you to be back for that. Uh, but this morning, I want us to look in 1 Kings 22. And this passage, I, it really, I mean, it's, it's the entire chapter. Uh, we won't necessarily read all of it. it. It is kind of lengthy. There are 53 verses here. I, I am aware it is fourth Sunday, which means it's fourth Sunday lunch. And so for me to come back from vacation and preach for three hours would probably be frowned upon, uh, which then again, some of you may not care. You just wouldn't be here for it. You'd be next door eating. Hey, is the preacher still going? He is. All right, fine, whatever. We'll see him this evening when we get back. Um, so I'm not going to do that. I know it's fourth Sunday lunch. We're not going to read this entire chapter, but we are kind of going to kind of tell what's going on in this chapter. And really, as we get started, I, I just want to kind of lay the groundwork. There's really, there's two kind of main guys that start off and another one that comes in later. So really three guys we're going to see here. But at the start, there are two kings. There's the king of Israel and the king of Judah. At this time, uh, Israel had been split in two. So King David, King Solomon, King Saul, those guys ruled over Israel, one kingdom. But after King Solomon, it split in two. And there was Judah and there was Israel, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. So there were two kingdoms. And as we're going to see here in a moment, the, the kings of those two kingdoms, the king of Israel was Ahab. You may be familiar with that name, uh, husband of Jezebel. So King Ahab reigned over Israel. Jehoshaphat at this time was reigning over Judah. So these two guys, we're going to see them come together. They had, uh, they had a, the same desire. They had uh, a willingness to work together to accomplish that desire. But before they went to it, Jehoshaphat said, hey, you know what? We should consult with the Lord. That's a good thing to do. He said, we should consult with the Lord. We should find the man of God, the prophet of God, and ask him what we should do. And as we'll see here, the, the name of a particular prophet of God came up, and Ahab said, I hate that guy. I can't stand him. 
He, he, man, oh, it just, you know, I mean, there's just so much we could fill in the blank here. But he said, I hate that guy. You could almost sense, you know, I mean, in, as we'll read here in a moment, Jehoshaphat saying, well, you hate the prophet of God. Why? Why do you hate the prophet or the preacher? Why do you hate him? And, and Ahab was not shy about telling why he hated him. He said, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, only evil. Now, again, if you know anything about Ahab, as we'll see a little bit later, it was justified. But this morning, I wonder how many, hopefully no one here, but I wonder if there's anybody here and when it comes time for the preaching of God's word, when it comes time for a preacher, any preacher, to stand up in front of you, do you say, oh boy, here we go again. Man, I can't stand coming to church. I can't stand hearing God's word preached because every time it's preached, it's never anything good for me. It's always negative. It's always calling out some sin in my life. I can't stand it. I absolutely hate it. Maybe you would be so bold to say this morning, and this is going to be the title of my message, Why Do You Hate the Preacher? Hey, maybe you would be so bold as to say, man, I can't stand that guy. I can't stand the preaching, and I can't stand the preacher, and I can't stand. And listen, some of you, if you're visiting with us this morning, like, I heard the pastor just got on vacation. What happened? Like, why is he preaching a sermon called Why Do You Hate the Preacher? Like, he came back ready for a fight. Hey, uh, that's not the case. Nobody, I haven't gotten any ugly notes or voicemails or anything like that. I haven't got text messages, die, preacher, die. None of that, okay? <laughs> I haven't gotten that, all right? There's nothing. Somebody just said, yeah. Was that John? Okay, listen. Well, I know which direction to preach this morning. All right. There's troublemakers right here, row one, row two. Um, Listen, it's, it's not anything to do with that. The Lord laid this message on my heart a few weeks ago as I was reading this passage. And with this idea, why do you hate the preacher? Hey, listen, uh, it may be, and this is across the church. This isn't just, I'm not talking church here. I'm talking church at large. It, it seems that a lot of times God's people or those who profess to be God's people, uh, they don't want to be told where they're wrong. They don't want their sin called out. That what they want is just to be told everything's good. You're doing great. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, if we were to go over and read what Paul said to Timothy, he, he said, listen, there's going to come a time. Now, he was writing this 2,000 years ago, and, and I think he was writing about today. He said, there's going to come a time where they won't listen to sound doctrine. They don't want to hear preaching. They want to have their ears tickled. In other words, they just want to hear something pleasant. They just want to hear, oh, you're good, you're fine, everything's fine. Doesn't matter what you want to do or how you want to live, everything is great. And listen, if you follow kind of church culture today, if you get on social media and you, you look at different people that profess to be preachers or different people that profess to be Christians, there's a lot of tickling of the ears going on in our culture. There's a lot of people that are saying, well, you know, it's kind of that idea. If you can't beat them, you might as well join them. I mean, just this last week, I was reading an article of an extremely well-known pastor who, 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 you know, people are kind of, the last few years I've been concerned with some of the things he's been saying, and people are kind of starting to come around to say, wow, he's kind of gone off the deep end. But what he's preaching is what people want to hear. Listen, if you just want to hear uh, something, something easygoing and says, hey, however you want to live, live it, and whatever you want to do, do it. If you, uh, I'm just going to tell you, uh, you know, kindly, this probably ain't the place for you. Because I'm, I'm going to do my best with God's help to preach what God says. Amen. And so I'm going to preach the word of God. And, and so if you sit there and I can't stand the preaching of God's word and I can't stand the preacher, then what you're going to find this morning as we see this passage and we see Ahab's problem with the prophet or the preacher, if we gave it a modern context, what you're going to see is the problem wasn't the preacher. The problem wasn't the word of God. The problem was Ahab's wicked lifestyle. And so I want us to jump into 1 Kings 22 this morning. We'll start in verse 1. We'll read first 14, 15 verses, and then I want to make some application from this passage. And so we back up to verse number 1. It says this, And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. There's a lot of background there. I encourage you to go back, read the, the previous couple chapters, and we'll tell you some of the things that were happening. But we won't dive into that right now. Verse 2, And it came to pass in the third year, that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel, king of Israel, Ahab. And the king of Israel saith unto, him, unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, 
and we be still and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he's upset. He says, Ramoth in the, in the region of Gilead, that's one of our places. And, and we're at peace with Syria right now, but why is Syria still occupying our land? Ramoth is ours. So he's kind of getting worked up about this right here. He's like, what, what, what's the deal with this? Why are they even there? We, we've got peace. We need this back. Well, how's he planning to get it back? So we keep reading. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle? To Ramoth Gilead and Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. In other words, yeah, man, whatever you need, I'm here for you. As a matter of fact, when I was doing some reading, he says, you know, I am as you are. I mean, these come to find out Jehoshaphat and Ahab, they were pretty tight. Ahab's, uh, Ahab's son was married to Jehoshaphat's daughter. Okay, so there's a family connection there, uh, which in that day, we know that oftentimes, uh, you know, children of kings would marry between different nations, forming alliances and, and different things, making, you know, strategic marriages. So uh, Jehoshaphat here, he's like, hey, man, I'm here for you. Whatever you need, Ahab, I, I, I'm your guy. My people are your people. My horse is your horses. And Jehoshaphat then, he does say this, though. He said unto the king of Israel, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Hey, man, I'm here for you. I, I'm willing to go to battle, uh, help you out. I'm willing to go. We'll get Ramoth Gilead from the Syrians. We'll go and we'll do it today. Hey, before we do, though, let's, let's see what the Lord has to say. Let's inquire of the Lord. Let, let's, let's seek out the word of God. And so we see in verse number six, then the king of Israel, Ahab, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, and sh or shall I forbear? And they said, go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? We'll dig into this a little more in a moment, but it kind of seems like, hey, I just want to cover all my bases. Is there anybody else? I want to make sure we've asked everybody. Verse number eight, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, but whom, uh, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Here's that, I hate that preacher. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. It's kind of that, oh, come on, man. Seriously, it can't be that bad. Seriously, let, let's give him a call. In verse 9, then the king of Israel called an officer and said, and you know, he was kind of saying this through gritted teeth. You know, Jehoshaphat's here. He's trying to save face. He's like, calls his servant. Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imla. And he probably grumbled and grunted a lot of that name. But he says, go get Micaiah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes and avoid place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Kenah, made him horns of iron. And he said, thus saith the Lord, with these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into thine hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Hey, we're going to pause right there. We will pick it up again here in a moment. But as, I, as we look at this passage and we look at Ahab saying, man, I hate that preacher. I hate that guy. He never says anything good about me. I wonder if there's anybody here today. Please do not raise your hand. Do not nudge anybody. Do not make any sort of outward declaration. But I wonder if maybe there's someone here today. You kind of been feeling that way. And there's never anything good said about my life. There's never anything good said about the way I live. It's always negative. And that preacher and all oh, that uh, Sunday school teacher. And uh, anytime I go to that men's meeting and I tell you, it, it's just there's never anything good said. I don't even know why I show up anymore. I wonder if that's the case for anybody. Listen, I believe as we look at this passage, there are a number of, number of lessons that we can learn that will help change our mind change our attitude towards the preaching of God's word the first thing I want you to see and by the way I know usually I have uh, notes up on the on the screen there are not any instead we have this beautiful little image of fall leaves just a reminder that it is fall okay um, but just follow along it's easy it'll be a simple outline this morning it just the notes won't be on the screen 
But the first thing as I look here, the first thing I want to challenge each of us with is this. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Listen, this is a great bit of advice for young people. It's a great bit of advice that we would encourage, encourage our teenagers, our, our kids. We would say, hey, listen, you, you, I think Krista tells the kids all the time, you know, show me your friends and I'll show me your future. Listen, we say that to young people all the time, that the people that you surround yourself with are going to dictate the direction that you're going to go. But guess what? It doesn't stop at 19 years old that that's good advice. Like at 20 and on, it still matters. The people you choose to surround yourself with, the people that you choose to listen to, the people that you choose to get your advice from, the people that you choose to engage with and say, hey, well, the way that I'm living, what do you think about this? The people you surround yourself with are going to have a major influence on your life, regardless of your age. Now, perhaps you've grown a bit and maybe that peer pressure doesn't have as much of a hold over you, but all of us are somewhat subject to peer pressure. All of us are somewhat, uh, somewhat weakened by the idea of what's so-and-so going to think about me? Is somebody going to laugh at me? What are the guys at work going to think about me? And so we oftentimes live our lives for the praise of men. Jesus spoke on that a number of times in the Gospels, and he, he talked about, hey, if you do what you do for the praise of men, that's your reward. There's no reward in heaven for you if all you're doing is living for the praise of other people. And he talked about that in context of praying and giving and, and different things like this. And so, uh, obviously, there's a lot that we could do for the praise of men. It's not going to get us anywhere. Listen, if only thing that you do is to, to please somebody else, you're, you're trying to please the wrong people. you, you got to be careful who... You surround yourself with. In our passage, I, I didn't make a lot of comment about this at the time because I wanted to kind of zero in on it. But in verse number six, it says the king of Israel, Ahab, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, now at first glance, this seems like a good thing. Uh, the, the king of Judah said, hey, Ahab, uh, let's consult with the Lord first. He's like, okay, I'll call the prophets in. And he calls 400 prophets in. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's a lot. Of, if, if it were some like preachers conference, I mean, that's a lot of preachers all in one room. Like if you look at them as just straight up, like these are preachers, okay? That's 400 preachers, probably loud, all right? Probably a, a big noise. I mean, you get three or four preachers in a room, it's gonna be loud, all right? Uh, but you had 400 guys in there. He said, what do you guys think? And he said, yeah, do it. Absolutely. The Lord is with you. But there's something we need to know about these 400 prophets. Remember, be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you're listening to. Be careful who your influences are. If we were to turn back to 1 Kings chapter number 18, we won't do that. But if we were, if we were to go back there, there's a story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. It's a familiar story. It's the one where he prayed and God rained down fire and it consumed the altar. And then it, it was just this, it's this, this great story of God's power and how he used Elijah. But in that passage, what you'll read, and this is where we usually focus, there were 450 prophets of Baal on that mountain. So it was Elijah versus the 450 prophets of Baal. Elijah, Elijah uh, through God's help, you know, God sending, his, sending fire from heaven, uh, Elijah prevailed. And then at the end of the passage, we read that the 450 prophets of Baal were slain. They were killed. But at the kind of the beginning when we start getting there, we read that Elijah's on Mount Carmel. We read about 450 prophets of Baal. There's kind of this parenthetical that doesn't get a lot of attention. There were 450 prophets of Baal and... 400 prophets of the groves that ate at Jezebel's table. And then we move on. And you never hear about the 400 prophets of the groves that ate at Jezebel's table again. We read that the prophets of Baal were slain, but we don't read anything about these 400 prophets of the groves that ate at Jezebel's table. Isn't it ironic or isn't it coincidental that just four chapters later, we're reading that Ahab calls the prophets to see what the Lord would have him do. And how many are there but 400 prophets? That's just an odd number of just four chapters later to be the same number. It, it, what, what, what we see here, and we'll see this as we dig in a little deeper, these were not prophets of God. 
These were 400 false prophets, may very well have been the same 400 mentioned in 1 Kings 18 that ate at Jezebel's table. Now, again, you may be familiar with Ahab, but if you are, it's probably because of who his wife was. Jezebel was a horribly wicked woman. As a matter of fact, after 1 Kings 18, after Elijah conquers the 450 prophets of Baal, God sends the fire from heaven. Everything works out just like it is. The people of God turn back to God because that was the whole message in that. How long halt you between two opinions, Elijah said. If God be God, serve him. And if Baal be God, then serve him. And at the end of 1 Kings 18, everyone says, we're going to serve God because God, the God of heaven is the one true God. We're going to repent of our sins. We're going to do away with the false gods. We're going to serve the one true God. 1 Kings 19, Jezebel says, Elijah, let, let God kill me if 24 hours from now you're not dead. Because she said, I'm coming after you. She was going to kill the prophet of God because he had defeated the false prophets. So, you know, if she's got 400 prophets of the groves that sat and ate at her table. These were not good guys. These were not prophets of God. These were more false prophets. Jehoshaphat says, Ahab, let's see what God says about us going up to Ramoth Gilead. Let, let's inquire of the Lord. And who does Ahab call for? 400 false prophets. Guys, what do you think we should do? You think God's in favor of this? And these 400 guys says, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, God is for you. God is on your side. God is gonna give you the victory. Uh, you should absolutely go up and do this thing. Go up for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of of the king and so he calls not the prophet of God but he calls the prophets of the grove in verse 12 11 and 12 so 6 it says that go up for the Lord shall deliver verse 11 and 12 we read this Zedekiah the son of Cana made him I mean this guy shows up this guy's going above and beyond this particular prophet he's like okay everybody's saying go up I'm going to do a show and tell like I'm going to I'm going to come with with something that I, I like a, a visual. OK. And so he shows up with horns of iron. He's like, I got these bull horns here. I made of iron. And so he shows up and he says, thus saith the Lord with these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And then all the other prophets. Yes. Go to Ramoth Gilead. Prosper. The Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. I mean, they're really hamming it up absolutely God's on your side God is for you you got this something I thought of as I was reading this passage oftentimes in scripture you'll see a large group professing something and they're saying the complete opposite of what God has to say Pharaoh had a dream and he called all of his sorcerers and astrologers and soothsayers called them all together and none of them could tell him what his dream meant he called one man a man of God, Joseph, who was able to interpret his dream. The king of Babylon has a dream, has a vision, calls his soothsayers, his astrologers, all of these different ones together. They can't interpret it. He calls one man of God, Daniel, who was able to tell him what it meant. Here we see the 400 coming saying one thing, but we're going to see there's one guy that comes to tell the truth in a moment. Listen, something that would be good for us to remember as we consider this idea, be careful who we surround ourselves with. Uh, more times than not, the crowd is not going to lead us in the direction that the Lord would have us to go. Now, we're sitting in church this morning, so I would hope that in this crowd, you know, that you would say, well, what if I were to stand up and say, listen, the Lord's been dealing with me on something. Will you all help me pray about it? Uh, I would hope that this crowd would say, yeah, we'll pray with you and we'll, we'll surround you in prayer. We'll lift you up and we'll, we'll encourage you. But Again, be careful who you surround yourself with. This would be a great crowd to surround yourself with, not just on Sunday morning, but all the time and be encouraged in the Lord. But what happens a lot of times is we show up on Sunday morning, man, we're so encouraged and we're so uplifted and we really feel blessed to have been with God's people and we, we really feel like, man, I, can, I could conquer the world today or, or tomorrow. I could, I could do anything now because I, I've been lifted up by God's people. But the thing is, tomorrow we won't have anything to do with each other or Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday. But next Sunday, we're back, and we're going to surround each other, and we're going to lift each other up. But who's lifting you up during the week? Who are you surrounding yourself with the other six days of the week? You see, too many of God's people will show up on Sunday to be encouraged, but they expect that encouragement to last them for seven days. 
and the rest of the time they have nothing to do with anybody else that's in the family of God. Instead, they surround themselves with people that are living for the devil. They surround themselves with people that are discouraging them from living for God. They're, living, they're surrounding themselves with people that'll lift up any negative thing they do and say, well, that's perfectly normal. I mean, listen, we live in a social media culture that, that if somebody calls you out on something, and I've seen this many times, and I'm not, not, I'm not saying, oh, well, there was that person here that did this. Just over the years, I've seen this happen. Hey, if somebody gets called out or told they were, they've done something wrong, they're going to put on Facebook or some other social media app, and they're going to say, can you believe what so-and-so said to me? They said the way that I'm living doing this is wrong. And you know what you're going to have? You're going to have a whole lot of people surround you and say, I can't believe that. How judgmental of them. How, how horrible that they would tell you that. Hey, you do you. You be you. you. You be who God made you to be. You live how you want to live. You don't have to answer to anybody. And you will be surrounded by voices telling you that everything about you is A-OK, even if you know you are living in sin. You'll have plenty of voices to say, you're good. Don't worry about that one who spoke up and told you you need to get right with God. What does he know? What does she know? Listen, Ahab, Jehoshaphat says, Ahab, let's, let's inquire the Lord. Okay, yeah, yeah, let me call in my 400 prophets. See what they have to say. I want to go up against Ramoth Gilead. And they came in and said, do it. Whatever you want to do, you do you. Do you want to go up? Absolutely, and God's going to be on your side. It's kind of like he wanted that rubber stamp, God's approval and what he was going to do regardless. And they were willing to give him anything he needed. Yep, absolutely. That, you know, they didn't know God at all, but they were willing to speak for God. And there's plenty of people that will use God's name that don't know God. Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 7. He said there's going to be many that stand before him. Say, hey, we spoke in your name. We did works in your name. We taught Sunday school in your name. We went to church in your name. We did all this in your name. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. You may have been saying my name, but we never had a relationship. There's going to be many that stand before Jesus. He says, I don't know you. How sad that is. In another place, he said that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. That means most of the people you know, they're not trying to live for God. Because he said narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be that find that. If you're listening to the crowd, and it's just, you know, I want to live like I want to live, what do y'all think? Most people are going to tell you, you do it. Go for it. But who's going to be willing to stand up and say, no, you're wrong? Here's what God says. Ahab has surrounded himself with 400 false prophets. Be careful who you choose to surround yourself with and who you choose to listen to. God's people ought to be surrounded by others who are seeking to follow God and who are willing to be called out. It's that idea, the guys talk about it a lot. It's even painted on their wall, iron sharpens iron. Hey, we need people that'll sometimes rub against us the wrong way. Like, it's not comfortable. Someone runs up, runs up to you and is like, hey, listen, I saw what you were doing earlier. You thought no one saw. I saw. You claim to be a child of God. You shouldn't be living like that. You shouldn't be talking like that. You shouldn't be treating your family like that. You shouldn't be involved in these things. Listen, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. But listen, it's better to be uncomfortable and be told the truth than for someone to say, well, you know, I'm just going to tell you a lie and it lead to your destruction. And so we see here, be careful who you choose to surround yourself with. Uh, but then as we continue on, I, I would encourage you this. Hey, if you're struggling with listening to the preaching, you're struggling with listening to the preaching, man, I, it's always negative. I can't stand this. I don't want to hear it. One, be careful who you're surrounding yourself with because they will influence what you are willing to listen to and what you are willing to receive. But two, be open to what the Lord says. Be open to what the Lord says, because if you're saying, I don't want to hear the preaching, I don't, everything's negative, and I don't want to hear this, and I can do what I want to do, and blah, then what you've done is you said, God, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I've got my own idea, and I've got my own way of doing things, and I've got plenty of people that will tell me it's okay. So, God, I don't need to hear from you. Be open to what the Lord says. Verse number eight. 
Oh, it's interesting. Verse 7. So Jehoshaphat, I, I, I don't know if it's just because he recognized some of the 400 prophets or if he, if he realized, wait, these are the ones that were eating at the table of Jezebel, and we all know about Jezebel. And quite frankly, I know about Ahab, and he's not much better than Jezebel. I, I don't know why exactly Jehoshaphat asked this, but he does say in verse 7, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? I mean, 400 people just said, yeah, absolutely, do it. God's on your side. You're going you're gonna to capture Ramoth Gilead. Go up to battle. It's all yours. Jehoshaphat says, hey, um, hey Ahab, anybody else? Are there any other prophets? Is, is there any, anybody else that we can call on to come and, uh, and, and tell us whether the Lord is for this or not? Maybe just one guy somewhere? Maybe it's because he knew that prophets of God didn't usually f travel in herds of 400. He knew they usually showed up one at a time, maybe two or three, but most of the time just one guy, Elijah, Elisha, Samuel. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Usually it was just one guy that showed up to deliver the message from God. So is, is there not one other guy somewhere? Remember I said be open to what the Lord says. What was Ahab's response? There is yet one man there's one other guy. It's Micaiah, the son of Imla. He, by him, we could inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Ugh. I can't stand that guy. I mean, it's another one of those situations where maybe, you know, when you read scripture, just kind of read it like you would think they said it. You know, he probably didn't say, well, hey, there's Micaiah, son of Imla. You know, he probably is like, Ugh. there's Micaiah. You know, maybe spit afterwards. It's like when I say Auburn. I mean, you know, I, uh, uh, just, just then. Like it was a bad taste in my mouth. Uh. So you can imagine. He probably, he said Micaiah's name and it probably, oh, it left a bad taste. And he, yeah, there's one guy. Mm, where's that? Micaiah. But I hate him. I can't stand that guy. Really? Why? Because he never says anything good about me. Every time I've ever asked him to come and prophesy, he only says something bad. He's always negative. He always says that I'm evil. He always says I'm sinful. He always says I need to change what I'm doing. Hmm. I wonder what the problem was. Was it the messenger? Was it the message? Or maybe it was the guy who was receiving it. Listen, we need to be open to what the Lord says. When you look at Ahab's life, yeah, he was an evil man, married to an even more evil woman. And so it's, it's understandable that the prophet of God would not come and say, oh, I got good news for you. God is going to bless you. God is going to rain down treasures upon you. God is going to enrich everything about you and enlarge your borders, and he's going to give you your enemy's head. And, and that's not what he was saying because Ahab was not living for God, so God wasn't going to bless him. He wasn't willing to hear it, though. I mean, he could have in previous encounters with Micaiah. I mean, this could have been a situation where, hey, we should inquire of the Lord. And right away, he said, I know just the guy. There's this guy by the name of Micaiah. He's a true prophet of God. He's not like one of those false prophets my wife called in. Listen, Micaiah's the real deal. And there's been time and time again where he would come to me and he would say, you need to get right with God. The way you're living is wicked and evil. And what you're doing is horrible. And at first I resisted him. But after a while, I was like, you know what? You're right. And I got on my face before God and I confessed my sins and I got right with God. Listen, he's going to tell us the truth. Let's call Micaiah. That would have been a great story. But he hadn't been willing to listen to Micaiah in the past. I hate this guy because he only ever says negative. He only ever says evil about me. He only is, he just goes on and on about him. And so when you look at this, I mean, Jehoshaphat, he knew. Ahab, he knew. These 400 guys, they were just telling him what they wanted to hear. I mean, Ahab had to know. These guys are not going to tell me the truth. They're going to tell me what I want to hear. He would rather listen to a lie because it's what he wanted to hear than listen to the truth that was going to correct his direction. And that sounds like a lot of God's people. That sounds like a lot of people in church that, hey, you know, they'll show up because they've got to check the box. I was there. I was at church on Sunday. I checked the box. Look at me. I got a faithful attendance, perfect attendance, except that I missed like half the Sundays. But other than that, it's like perfect attendance. So I've checked the box. But I don't care what it was a message on. Couldn't tell you. I don't go there for the sermons. 
because it's never anything worth anything. It's never, it's never for me. It's because it's that guy down the, down the other end of the pew, he needed it. I know he did. I, I've seen him, but not me. I'm good. And a lot of God's people, they just show up to check the box and they don't care what the word was. They don't care what the message was. They don't care what was directed right at them. They just want to check the box. And listen, you're not getting even half of what you need to get from church if you just show up to check a box. You've got to come ready. You've got to come prepared. You've got to come open to hear what the Lord says. God, I'm not, I'm not worried about the person sitting next to me today. I'm, I'm sure they got their own issues, but I'm not worried about what they're trying to get today. God, I need something from you today. Hey, God, if there be any wicked way in my life, show that to me. If there's some way that I need to change, show that to me. God, if there's some way that I need to be better before you, I need to serve you more faithfully. I need to, uh, I mean, uh, Bobby spoke last week about continually seeking the Lord. That's not something that like, well, I showed up for church one time. I was like, hey, God, if you guys want to say to me, say it. And he never did that day, so I just stopped asking. And no, continually saying, God, give me something today. God, I, I, I need something from you today. I, I, I need you to challenge me, encourage me, convict me. I mean, sometimes I'll pray that. I'll say, you know, today, provide whatever it is people need, whether that's a challenge or a conviction, whether that's encouragement. Because I can preach one sermon and, and each of you get something different from it. You may have shown up struggling with sin, maybe not, not, maybe not struggling, maybe enjoying. And maybe you came enjoying sin. And so when you hear the message, it's convicting. It's that it's always negative. But the person sitting down the row from you, they came and they're like, man, that's, that was such an encouragement. I, I, man, that message was great. I appreciate you encouraging me with that. Listen, are you open to hear what the Lord has to say? Ahab was more willing to hear the lies of the 400 than to hear the truth of the one. So much so, his servant, he sent his servant, all right, fine, go get Micaiah. His servant comes to Micaiah, he's like, you better listen to me, you troublemaker. I know how you are, you listen to me. I know how you always go in there and you cause trouble and you tell, you tell the king stuff that he don't want to hear. He's already listened to 400 prophets and they all told him good stuff. You better get in there and tell him good news. Don't you be the odd man out. Micaiah says, hey, I'm going to tell him whatever the Lord tells me to tell him. Let's pick up reading verse 15. We just got to 14. We still got like 40 verses left. Just kidding. We're not going to look at all of them. But <laughs> Verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, hey, man, go on. You go. You do it. You go. You're going to prosper. The Lord will deliver you into the hand of the king. It's going to be good. Now, that's the exact same thing the other 400 just told him. The same thing. Told him the exact same thing. But there was something about the way he said it. Like there was, I don't know if he was just really being sarcastic. Like, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Go for it. It's going to be great. I can't wait to sit down with some popcorn and watch you go to battle because this is going to be good. I am looking forward to this. I don't know what he said, but it got Ahab's attention because 16 says, and the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? Now, I don't know if he was just putting on a show for Jehoshaphat because it seemed like he was pretty content to listen to lies. But now in front of Jehoshaphat, he's, he, there's something about the way Micaiah said it or his facial expression, his body language. Something said he's lying. This is not what he truly believes. He is not, he's saying the same thing the 400 said. They never agree on anything. So he's like, how many times do I have to tell you? Only tell me the truth, which probably was the first time he had ever told him that. Just that's my opinion. I mean, but he was obviously more willing to listen to 400. Jehoshaphat's sitting there, though, and he's like, I'm telling you, tell me the truth. Verse 17, Micaiah's like, oh, I'm getting there. He says, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did not I tell you that he would prophesy no good thing concerning me but evil? What, what he just said was, what, what Micaiah told him, he's like, hey, okay. I'll tell you what God said. You go on to battle. 
But what's going to happen is Israel's going to wander around. They're going to be like sheep scattered, nobody leading them because you're going to be dead. They're not going to have a king. You're going to go to battle and you will die in battle. That's what's going to happen if you go up to Ramoth Gilead. That's what's going to happen. And what was his response? Didn't I tell you he was only going to tell me negative? I told you he's always saying so. That's why I hate this preacher. I can't stand him. <clears throat> in response to that, I'll summarize. I'll, I'll, I'll jump down here a little bit. Here's what he said. Put Micaiah in prison. And it says, feed him the bread of affliction and give him the water of affliction until I come back. He's like, you know what? Throw him in prison and don't be nice. Okay? Get, rough him up a bit. And when I get back, we'll deal with it. And I love what Micaiah said in response to that. And Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, like you, if you even make it back, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, O people, every one of you. He's like, Ahab, man, you ain't coming back. If you do, then I'm not a prophet of God. Then I ain't heard nothing that God ever said. Because God told me, you're not coming back. Listen, Ahab, he was not willing to hear what the Lord had to say to him. If he had been, then when he heard from Micaiah, he would have said, okay, this, this venture to go up and reclaim Ramoth Gilead, this is, a, we're not supposed to do this. Like, it's, if I'm going to die if we do it, then I'm pretty sure we shouldn't do this, okay? I mean, look, if one of y'all says, hey, uh, we, need to do, we need to start this particular ministry, but by the way, you're going to die when we start it. Can I tell you something? We're not starting that ministry, okay? <laughs> Like, I might have to have a very clear word from the Lord that I am supposed to start a ministry that will result in my death, okay? But if you're just like, hey, I think we need to uh, add another Sunday school class, but by the way, you're going to die when we do it. Well, we're just going to stay in the Sunday school classes we're in. I'm not doing that. But King Ahab was just told, you're going to die if you do this. And he's like, I, I'm, I'm, whatever. Let's go. 400 people told me I could do it. We're going. I wonder, are, are you open to the word of the Lord? Are you open to what you read in his word or what you hear preached from his word? Regardless, and this isn't about me. It's about whoever you listen to. And I've said for years now, hey, I encourage you, listen to other guys. I mean, have, you know, have different guys that you listen to. But just like I've said about myself, I say about anyone else you listen to, always, whoever it is, me or anybody else, compare what you hear with the word of God. Don't take my word for it. Study it out for yourself. Are you open to what the Lord has to say? Are you open to reading his word and to hearing his word preached, even if it's not something you want to hear. I mean, hey, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It, this, 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 the truth contained here, it can say, I know you think you're okay, but it's so sharp it can cut right down to the heart and say, but right here, that, that spot right there, that's sin that you're harboring. The, the things you're doing, it's because of sin. The, the re, you're, you're living in rebellion to God. It, surrender to him and to his word. Get right with him. Listen, Ahab is proof that listening to the lies of the crowd is not going to work out for you, even if it's exactly what you wanted to hear. Only heeding the truth of God's word will benefit us. So we see here, be careful who you surround yourself with. Be open to what the Lord says. And then finally, and, and again, I'll summarize here, but final point, be wise in following God's word. Receive it, but it's not just enough to receive it. Okay, you said that I'm living in sin. You know, you're right, I am living in sin. You, you said I need to change the way I live. You're right, I need to change. You, you, you said I should get into God's word. You're right, I should get. That's receiving it, but then you have to follow it. You have to do it. Micaiah said, if you go to battle, you will die. Ahab thought, I know what I'll do. Number one, I'm going to go to battle because that's what I want to do. And 400 prophets told me I could. So I don't care what Micaiah said. But just in case, just in case Micaiah had any amount of truth in what he had to say, here's what we're going to do. Jehoshaphat, you can read the rest of the passage on your own. I'm going to summarize it. He said, Jehoshaphat, you put on your royal robes. Now this was Talk about being careful who you surround yourself with. Jehoshaphat needed to have better company himself too, okay? He's like, hey, Jehoshaphat, here's the deal. They're going to be looking for the king. Put on your royal robes. You wear your crown. You wear your robes. 
I'm going to put on just some old ratty stuff. There's no way a king would ever wear this. I'll have a hood on. They'll never even know I'm a king. But you go out there all shiny and bright and everything so they know you're a king because they're going to be after the king. You do that. Jehoshaphat's like, hey, that's a great idea, man. I'm totally going to put on my robes and my crown, and I'm big. I'm going to put this big circle on my chest with a little red and a little bullseye. I'm like, I'm here. I'm the king. But Ahab puts on this disguise, and he goes out. And, and you know what happens? The king of Syria said, listen, don't worry about the foot soldiers. Don't worry about the peasants. Don't worry about anybody. You go after the king because if we get the king, everything else falls. And what did they do? They came out, and guess what they saw? They saw a king. And there he is. And so now there's Jehoshaphat. And we read, if you read the passage, Jehoshaphat is like, wait a second. They're after the king. Oh, no. And he takes off. But as the, as the Syrians draw near, they're like, wait, that's not Ahab. That's not even the right king. Oh, man. Ahab didn't even come out. Like Ahab stood us up. Oh, well. And an archer takes his bow. He's like, man, that really, that really just upsets me. I'm just going to let an arrow fly. I'm just going to, oh, I wish I could have shot that at the king. And that arrow that he just let fly, of all of Israel, it happened, and by happened I mean the hand of God, it happened to find Ahab. And it happened to land in between two parts of his armor. So it just so happened to be the arrow that killed Ahab. King, if you go up, you will die. But I want to. This is how I want to live. This is the lifestyle I want to engage in. This is the sin I want to embrace. I want to. I want to. But God said no. But I want to. Go for it. But God will have justice. God will punish you. God will, in common day vernacular, God will get his man. And that's exactly what happened to Ahab. I'll trick them. He couldn't trick God. God knew exactly where he was at all times. And so be wise in following God's word. When you hear what God has to say, don't just hear it, follow it. Receive it and follow it. Listen, not following the word of the Lord won't necessarily end in your death. That is a possibility. But it doesn't, you know, God doesn't necessarily say, hey, you disobey me, you will die right now by an arrow that some guy just randomly shoots. Okay? Listen, you disobedience may lead to death but it will definitely it may but it may not but it definitely will lead to a disruption in your relationship with the father it, it will definitely cause a distance as you pull away from him it, it will certainly cause distraction from what is right and what you should be doing it, it will certainly cause distress in your life see when we choose not to obey god as God's people, as those who profess to have given our lives to Christ, when we choose not to follow the word of God, yeah, it's all negative from there on out. There's no positive of saying, I'm going to rebel against God. I'm going to live in sin, but it'll be okay. That's not going to happen. It is negative. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So when I asked the question earlier, I gave the title, Why Do You Hate the Preacher?, Maybe you said, I don't. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. All right. I appreciate that. As the preacher, as the pastor, I appreciate if you truly do not hate the preacher. Hey, maybe you say, hey, listen, it ain't always easy. It's not always comfortable. But I appreciate when the word of God is preached by me or Bobby or Frank or anybody else. I appreciate when the word is preached, even when it's uncomfortable, because that iron sharpens iron. That's God chipping away those parts that shouldn't be part of my life so that I'm constantly being conformed into the image of his son who is perfect and sinless and holy and righteous. So yeah, get, away, get, get those things away from me that don't look like him. Maybe you say, that's me. I love that. There's different ones that, that'll say to me at different times, like, man, you stepped on my toes, but I appreciate it. Uh, or or uh, Brother Danny, sometimes I, I don't remember the exact way he'll phrase it, but he'll say something like, man, I, 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 it's like a shotgun blast. I got hit all over, but, but, but I appreciate it, brother. Like, hey, hey, listen, maybe that's you, and I appreciate that. Each of us, from the preacher to every one of us, we all need to be open to what God has to say. And when something doesn't look right, according to what he says, we need to get rid of it. So if you're one of those like, I don't hate the preacher, I don't hate the preaching, I love to be challenged, praise the Lord. Keep doing that. 
But maybe you're one. Maybe you wouldn't be so bold to say, I hate the preacher. But maybe with your lifestyle, you say, I, I really couldn't care less about what is preached. I really couldn't care less about what God's word says. Hey, look, I gave my life to Christ as a child. And you know what? God, I, know, I know God saved me, but I'm just not, I'm not one of those that's like going to be on fire for him. I'm not going to be one of those holy rollers that does like everything the Bible says. There's some things I just prefer to do. There's some things that you may call sin that I just kind of, you know what, I prefer them. Listen, that's a dangerous path you're walking on. There's so much that the Bible says about rebellion. As a matter of fact, if we were to look back, uh, look back over there in Samuel where Saul rebelled against God, he was actually what we would call, he was partially obedient. In 1 Samuel 15, he was partially obedient. And in that moment, the, the prophet, one man, Samuel, showed up and he said, hey, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I mean, he, he, he lit into him about what he had done. And so much so, it cost him the kingdom. It cost Saul the kingdom. Listen, God is really serious about rebellion. He's really serious about us being obedient to him. He's really serious about us getting out of the way of what he wants to do in our lives. And so, are you willing to listen to God's word? Are you willing to follow God's word? And also, hey, what kind of people are you surrounding yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with people that are just going to pat you on the back and be like, everything's fine, the way you're living's fine, don't worry about how you're doing things, it doesn't matter, that's so old-fashioned to say follow the Bible. Listen, we need to be careful who we surround ourselves with. As I close, maybe there's someone here today that following the Word of God, getting right as far as confessing sin, that's not really what you need right now. What you need is you need to come to faith in Christ. It's not about just saying, God, I'm sorry, I, I, I've strayed. No, you've never come to faith in Christ, and maybe there's someone here like that. You need to give your life to Christ today. And we were obviously in the Old Testament. We weren't talking about Jesus today. I referenced him a number of times, but in the New Testament, Jesus, we read that he died on the cross, taking the punishment for all of us for our sins on himself so that we wouldn't have to. And he says that any who will come to him by faith, who will call on him, he will save us. If you've never done that, if you've never given your life to Christ, I would love to talk to you more here in a few minutes about how you can know you have a home in heaven, how you can know that your sins are forgiven, and how you can start a new life with him, walking with him. Again, I don't know who the message is for today. Maybe it's just a reminder. Maybe it's just an encouragement. Hey, we need to stay faithful to him and listen to him, listen to his word and not be consumed with the voices around us that are telling us, oh, your sin is fine, God's okay with that. Maybe it's just a reminder. Maybe there's somebody here that's been struggling. They don't want to hear what God has to say because if they listen and if they heed it, they're going to have to make some changes and they're just not really ready to do that. Whatever it is, I pray that you would hear and surrender to what God has to say. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for this story from the Old Testament there in the book of Kings. Lord, I, I, I pray for each one here, each of us. I know sometimes we can fall into that habit of only wanting to hear what we want to hear, only wanting to hear good. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be corrected. We just want to be told everything we're doing is fine. And there's times we stray. And maybe it's hard to sit under preaching week after week when it always seems like it's negative. Lord, the answer to that is not just double down and hold on to our sin, but rather it's to surrender, to confess it, to get right with you. So maybe there's somebody here today, they need to get right with you. It's not that they hate the preacher. It's not that they hate the preaching. They just hate the message. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Lord, convict them today. Draw them to you. If there's somebody here that's never come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would do that today, Lord. I just pray that you would have your will and way in each and every heart today and do what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen.